Well, good afternoon, Club 17, and, and welcome to another segment of Rotarian Spotlight. And, and as you know, uh, since we're not able to meet, I, I thought we'd, it'd be kind of fun to interview a variety of Rotarians to, uh, to get to know them better and to allow us to each uh, feel more connected to one another through this crisis. So, so today we're really fortunate to have uh, Doug Bolton with us today. So good afternoon, Doug. Good, good afternoon, uh, Dave and everyone. It's good, good to, uh, to be with you, not necessarily see you, but to be with you. Exactly. That'll come hopefully very, very soon. So, you know, I've gotten to know you, Doug, a little bit better over the last year, I would say, as, as I've interfaced with you and the program committee. And, and uh, for those who don't know, Doug has been a leader of the program committee and who arranged our speakers for quite a number of years. And, and, uh, and one of the things that, uh, that we learned through our membership satisfaction survey this past year was that our members are extremely satisfied with, um, with the speakers and the lineup that we have. And, and are very, very interested to, uh, to attend because of that each and every week, among other things. So I think that's a certainly kudos to you and the committee for all the great things you've done over the years. So I had a, a really great teacher. So I worked uh, under Al Conscience for many years on the program committee. And uh, he, he was a great leader um, for our program committee for many years. So learn, learned every, all the tricks from him and uh, and I'm glad he still is connected with us. Uh, he, he, we throw him a lifeline, as you know, we throw him a lifeline from time to time, and he always comes through. So it's, it's, a, it's a good place for me to be. Well, both of you have uh, very nice Rolodex files, so um, I'm sure that helps out. And, and to your point, I mean, Al, I, uh, the other day, was able to get a hold of Brad Rins Winstrup and, and uh, arrange him to, uh, to come in and, and be part of our meeting. So. So you guys do an amazing job. So tell me a little bit about yourself, um, maybe a little bit about your family, your career, uh, maybe some, some things that you enjoy doing when you're, you're not working. Absolutely. So, um, you know, this whole COVID crisis uh, is, is a little scary for both my wife and I um, pers personally, because our daughter is a nurse. Uh, so we were only blessed with one child. Um, and um, uh, she uh, went to University of Kentucky Nursing School and, and stayed down in, in Lexington for several years working at the, the medical center down there. And we were thankful that um, she came back home uh, and uh, is now living um, five miles from us, uh, she and her husband. Um, but, but she is a, a, a labor and delivery nurse. Um, so knock, knock on wood, fortunately, none, none of her patients have, have had the virus, but uh, um, I, I tell her she's, she's our modern day warrior. She's going into battle every single day. Um, and so it is a little scary with respect to the impact on the healthcare field in particular, but um, you know, it, it, it's a, um, you know, we, we're very blessed, um, you know, in the, in the scheme of, of how this crisis has impacted so many lives and so many families and so many individuals. So, you know, you, even though we've been inconvenienced um, to a great deal and, and connecting with our family, um, it's, um, it's nothing compared to what um, most people have gone through. So, um, you know, as I said, um, my wife and I were only blessed with one child, but um, my, my wife actually had many many children. Uh, she was a teacher for 30 years, um, retired from teaching. Um, and so we, we, can't, um, we can't go out to eat um, <laughs> anywhere without uh, one of her former students coming up and, and giving her a big hug and, and connecting with her. So, um, you know, very proud of, of, uh, of Kateri and the work that she, she did as a, as a teacher. Um, both in public schools um, as well as uh, some parochial schools that she worked in in the latter part of her career, and um, are um, uh, very proud of our our son-in-law as well. He's a real estate uh, commercial real estate broker. Um, um, actually worked for me for a while, and uh, now is uh, is working with um, uh, a, a leading commercial real estate company and uh, um, doing phenomenal. Um, so. Um, as you know, probably many Rotarians know, I, um, I went to journalism school, um, focused my, my work in the media business for 25 years as a reporter, editor, and then publisher, my last stop at the Business Courier, 
um, phenomenal um, uh, work um, and um, you know, love, love that, was recruited away um, and uh, ran a commercial real estate services business. Uh, what was then Cassidy Turley became DTZ and then we, we changed our name again to Cushman and Wakefield and um, that was a great experience leading um, that office which was the leading commercial real estate services firm in, in greater Cincinnati and and um, you know, learned learned a lot. Taught taught me uh, a lot about uh, things that I maybe didn't have the experience in in the media business. Uh, but um, you know, did that for um, for seven years. Uh, we we um, became a shareholder in the business, and then we sold the business to private equity. And I stayed on for a couple more years after working under private equity, and had had enough, and began to think about you know, okay, what was my third act going to be, and and um, connected uh, with uh, Craig Young, who um, I had served on the board of the Dan Beard Council, the Boy Scouts together with for 15 years. So knew him, and, um, and when he heard that I was thinking about doing something different, he, uh, he came to me and, and said, I'm, I'm building something. I think you'd really enjoy it. It, it focuses on, on um, building a better volunteer ecosystem. It's something you're very familiar with, Doug, um, based on your time in the community and and he was absolutely right it's been a, a love uh built it's, it's built on on uh you know 25 years in the media business my seven years in commercial real estate the common theme across those two was volunteering you know service above self and so um it's been a labor of love for the last couple of years um helping to move cincinnati from you know, remarkably, we were worst among our peers from a volunteer standpoint to now best among our peers. So we're really, really proud of the work that um, that we've done done there. Um, you know, you asked uh, about hobbies and interests, and I'm a workaholic, so my mm -hmm. wife would say my hobby is my work. Um, but I, I do try to run, um, exercise, um, and then um, we bought a small farm a couple of years ago um, because uh, the, the horses that we acquired for my daughter's riding experience became my wife's and I's horses and we we boarded those for a long time boarded those horses for a long time at some facilities and and um, got tired of the boarding life and so we we bought a small farm moved our horses here and so um, if I'm not running um, swimming um, working, then I'm, I'm shoveling, you know what, so <laughs> people, people will, will think that the, the a horse life, a horse owner's life is glamorous. It's not, it's not at all. <laughs> and, and do you sleep at all? I mean, that, that schedule seemed to be pretty compact to me. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, I was joking with someone the other day about how this whole remote, life has given us maybe a taste of of um you know what being at home is like and while it is phenomenal not having to spend time in my car um uh you know it it is uh i mean it, it it's you you still end up working a lot and and literally i'm probably working more hours now um than i was before um uh, because it's so it's so easy to work um, and um, yeah and and sleep has never been part of my priorities uh, but when I was a journalist um, and and certainly not now so um, I, I definitely break all the rules with respect to the amount of hours that, of sleep that you're supposed to get all right well let's shift gears just a, a bit and, and tell me a, a fun fact about yourself that maybe no other Rotarian knows so many people don't know that I have not lived in Cincinnati for more than 20 years. Um, you know, and, and so I, I, um, I, we lived in Northern Kentucky when I was editor of the Business Courier and um, got the opportunity to become publisher of uh, the Dayton Business Journal. And so for about six months, I drove from Northern Kentucky through downtown Cincinnati, through Cincinnati, Lo uh, Lo uh, the, the uh, Lachlan, uh, Evendale, into downtown Dayton. So I did that for six months. 
and it was awful. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so we moved uh, uh, from Northern Kentucky up to Centerville, Ohio in Southern Montgomery County. And, um, and so that was 1997, 1998 when we moved. And so, um, you know, uh, it, it was uh, a good, good move for, for our family in order to be in Dayton. I was publisher of the Dayton Business Journal um, and uh, had a phenomenal um, experience there. And then a couple of years after we moved, my old boss at the Courier left. And so the company that owned the Courier asked me if I wanted to come back to Cincinnati and be publisher. And I did, um, and um, but I but our daughter was getting ready to start high school, and I did not want to move. Um, I had moved when I was a child between my eighth grade and ninth grade year, and it was the worst year of my life. And I just did not want to do that to my daughter. So I said, I, I can drive, no big deal. Um, it's not as far of a drive because it's just from the southern side of Dayton to uh, downtown Cincinnati. Um, so it was about 50 minutes from Centerville to, to downtown. And I said, I can do it for at least four years, um, no big deal. And so here it is, we still live um, just a little further outside of, of Dayton. We moved, the farm that we bought is in Bellbrook. Um, so about five miles from Centerville. So not still not very far. It's about a 55 mile drive from my house to downtown Cincinnati and continue to do that while I was publisher of Cincinnati, a business courier. And then when I moved to the real estate company, continued to drive um, and now still continue to do that drive. And that surprises a lot of people that I have that I live outside of Cincinnati because um, I do go to a lot of events and stay downtown and, and in the community late in the evenings and still am able to get up and do seven o'clock uh, board meetings and all those kinds of things. So. Um, it is a, I, I don't necessarily call it a fun fact, but it is a fact about me that it is surprising for a lot of people that they didn't know that I lived, didn't, didn't live either in Hamilton County or immediate Cincinnati. Well, I'm sure you know every single pothole and every bump in 75. Yes, Interstate 75, Interstate 71, 275, I, I know every single route to get to downtown when there's bad traffic. I know when not to be on the road. Um, so yeah, you, you, <laughs> you need some, if you need some guidance on, on the freeway, I'm your guy. Sounds good. Well, let me, let's talk a little bit about your Rotary experience. I mean, you, I think you joined in 2001, so you've had a, a long history with Rotary and served in many different ways, but tell us a little bit about your experience and, and uh, maybe some of your fondest memories. Yeah, so um, my experience with Rotary actually goes back further than that because I joined the Covington Rotary Club when we lived in Northern Kentucky and I was editor of the Courier. And um, so really th that, you know, the Covington Rotary Club was my first experience. Then when we moved to Dayton, became publisher, um, joined the Dayton Rotary Club, which, um, you know, I think many of our members know of the Dayton Rotary Club because of the of the, uh, the rivalry between our bowling teams and other sports and things like that. But um, the Dayton Rotary Club is a phenomenal organization, um, you know, who's who of business in Dayton. So it was, it was important to me to join um, the Dayton Rotary Club when I was publisher of the Business Journal. And then when I came back to Cincinnati, as you, as you mentioned in 2001, um, came back home um, to, to the Cincinnati Rotary Club and, um, um, you know, I, I think I've told this story many times to, to potential new members, you know, that, that, I, that I joined Rotary for, you know, the, the connection, the, the, the networking. Um, many Rotarians were my readers of the business courier, you know, so did it for, you know, business purposes. Um, but in fact, um, you know, I stay because of the friendships, because of the network, because of what it means to me, um, you know, and, and what it means to our community um, uh, in service above self um, is, is such a, an important um, part of so many people. It, it's, it's what gives all of us purpose in life, our volunteering. Um, and so, you know, it, it should, it, I'd, I'd love to somehow figure out a way that, that um, you know, every, every American should have to give 
some amount of time to a, a, a service organization um, because it, it can have so much impact on their lives. Um, so that's, that's how Rotary, you know, has, has had an impact on me. Um, you know, it, it's, um, I'm a big believer that you, you volunteer and you do service in the community that you love near where you work, near where you live. Um, but what Rotary provides me is that connection to, you know, 195 countries across the world. Um, and, and I don't do a lot of traveling, but, you know, w one of these days maybe will, maybe, um, you know, I, I, I love the idea of being connected to so many Rotarians across the world and, and being able to spark a conversation with someone um, about that common um, bond that, that uh, Rotarians have. So that, that is a, a very important aspect of it um, to me. You know, and then, and then finally, you know, we talked about my work on the program committee. I, you know, I do feel strongly that, that uh, you know, the commitment that Rotarians make um, to Rotary um, is, is a big one. And I, wanna, I want to fulfill um, that experience by having great programs and, and um, Rotary clubs across the world are, um, are notorious for being um, great places for business leaders, community leaders, important issues to be discussed and talked about. And so um, that's why I love my work on the program committee uh, in terms of, um, you know, just, just making sure that I, 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 am, I am my customer. I, I, I want to have people speak to us that I want to hear from. Um, and so that's, that's, um, that makes that work easy, easy to do. It's a, lo a lot of work, but it, it makes it easy to do. Well, it shows. So absolutely. You know, with your, with your, uh, your third uh, chapter, as you called it earlier, and as president and CEO of Cincinnati Cares, um, you know, you're, you're certainly a, an important part of the nonprofit fabric in our community. So obviously with this COVID crisis, a lot of things have changed. Um, I know you and your team have been extremely busy uh, working on different uh, new approaches and so forth, but tell us a little bit about what has changed and, and some of the things you are working on to uh, maneuver this crisis. Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, pivot has become an overused word, I think, for a lot of businesses, a lot of nonprofit organizations, and um, it, it absolutely uh, is, uh, uh, you know, just describes what we found ourselves needing to do um, because, you um, you know, we, we, as I mentioned, we, we have had some phenomenal success of becoming the most popular way for volunteers, prospective volunteers to find their way to help in Cincinnati. And, um, and our platform has been successful. And so other communities have, have asked us to build that platform. And we did that in Boston and Los Angeles and the entire state of Nevada. Um, and so in, in mid, mid February, you know, we were looking at the numbers of referrals that our that our platforms were making to nonprofit organizations in each one of those communities, and we were having record numbers, you know, record numbers in December and January and and early February. And and as February got a little older, um, our our data geeks were saying to us, something's going on. People are still coming to our websites, but they're not taking action. They're not clicking on the referrals, and clearly. The COVID scare um, was occurring, you know, before our eyes in mid, in mid February, long before the national and the local and state uh, states of emergency. So um, we we knew we could, you know, do nothing, and our referral numbers would drop. And you know, clear, clearly in 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 March, we have seen, you know, the traditional ways that we refer volunteers to nonprofit organizations um, isn't happening, and it shouldn't. Um, so we, we knew we could just sit still and do nothing, or we knew we, we could do something, and, and that something was, um, you know, our, our nonprofit partners, the 700 nonprofits in Greater Cincinnati that we refer volunteers to, um, you know, we, we talk about how, you know, the average nonprofit, 40% of their resources comes from volunteers, um, and so when you rip out 40% of a nonprofit's resources because it's not safe for the volunteers to be there, then that is devastating to the nonprofit. So we knew that our nonprofit partners were going to be hurting deeply because of that. And then you put on top of that the 
stay-at-home emergencies and the cancellation of hundreds of events um, that, that nonprofits rely upon for fundraising. Um, and, and that is a, you know, a, a double whammy um, for nonprofits. And then the triple whammy of not being able to deliver on program revenue that, that they're promised. Uh, you know, so Medicaid is not going to pay um, particular human services or organizations to deliver on their mission because they didn't see the patients or they didn't deliver the, the, uh, the services. And so our nonprofit community is absolutely facing a triple whammy that they have never experienced before. You know, 911 was, was obviously the last big disaster, big, big, um, enormous disaster that, that sparked volunteerism and, and, it, and it did. Um, but in this disaster, um, it, it didn't, it's not sparking, you know, volunteerism because you can't do the things that you normally would, would do. Um, so we pivoted to um, use our platform, you know, in a way that hopefully would help our nonprofits. And we think it has in terms of being able to um, tell their stories, help nonprofits tell the impact of COVID-19, um, share their data, um, how COVID impact, how COVID has impacted their revenues, how it has impacted them you know, having to lay off staff, furlough employees. Um, and then, and finally, um, helping um, organizations think about, okay, how can I engage volunteers in a safe way? So, you know, there are ways that volunteers can do things remotely, um, can do things online, can do things in a socially distant, safe way. Um, and so those were three of the things that we put into place on our website um, prom promptly to be able to help our nonprofits recover. And then the final piece, which was to help the recovery process, was turning on something that we had never imagined that we would do. We wanted to be 100% focused on volunteering, um, but we turned on the ability for our visitors to donate to the nonprofits. And so... Um, we, we are simply a connection vehicle to all of the donating opportunities. So we don't take a fee. We don't charge anything. We, we essentially direct people that come to our website who traditionally have come to our website to find a volunteer opportunity. Um, they can now find that perhaps in a safe and socially distant way, but then they can also um, make a donation if they, number one, can't volunteer because they're taking care of their kids they're trying to figure out how their business is going to survive. And, and then thirdly, um, there aren't that many opportunities for people to engage remotely, not, not enough, um, in a safe way. So um, hopefully the donate feature allows people to feel good about themselves to be able to help the nonprofit sector. And so um, our, our, our numbers of visitors and the, the help that we're providing our nonprofits um, has increased. And, and only hopefully made our community stronger. Um, but like before, other communities have noticed what, we're, what we've done and, um, and they've asked us to bring the tool to them. So we have deployed the, 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 the new platform tool um, in 15 communities and, um, and we're talking with a number of other communities about, about putting the platform in, in place as well. Uh, again, as a way to bring together the community around, um, you know, volunteering, safe volunteering, um, and then a, a, a single place that people can find the places to help the nonprofit sector in those communities um, recover. So from Tampa Bay to Cleveland to Charleston um, to San Antonio, um, Los Angeles, Boston, um, our work has spread beyond Cincinnati in a way that we never would have imagined happening in the first half of, of 2020. Um, you know, we, we did believe that our platform would extend to other communities at some point in time, but we thought five years, 10 years, um, bef you know, we have a long runway to get this done, but it's um, the COVID crisis has, has accelerated um, those plans immensely. It's uh, sometimes the, these things that you create or uh, catch on like wildfire. And it looks, it appears to me that that's what's going on right now, especially in this crisis. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I, it, it is, a, I mean, just, you know, 
again, back to the idea of, of 911 being an immense disaster for our country. And, and of course, then the financial, the fin financial disaster was everywhere, but it, it did not have the enormous impact um, that, that, you know, a, a shutting down of, of the country's economy um, is, is having on nonprofits. Um, you know, there were nonprofits, obviously, that didn't make it through the 2008 financial disaster, but this one has the threat of, of clearly making it difficult for nonprofits to survive. And so we're, we're only doing what, what is, is kind of our little part of, of trying to help nonprofit sectors in every community get through this, rebuild. You know, we rebuilt, we rebuilt the volunteer ecosystem in Cincinnati. Um, we know we're going to have to rebuild it again, and, and other communities are going to have to rebuild their volunteer um, sectors. You know, um, I mean, Rotarians are a little different in that service is wired into us, um, and so you can't imagine not doing the volunteering. But but for the normal human being, I guess I just called Rotarians not normal. Um, <laughs> you know, for the normal human being, you get you um, you stop doing the things that you normally do, go to work, you get busy. You maybe do a little volunteering, but for the normal human being, being, you know that normalcy changes, and then maybe you don't you don't go back to do the volunteering that you had traditionally done. So that's the rebuilding that is going to have to happen in our ecosystem in Cincinnati as well as across the country. Sounds good. Well, Doug, I've been called a lot of things, but I've never been called abnormal like you did call me today, and I really appreciate <laughs> that. I love being called abnormal and being a Rotarian. So, and I think our, our entire club thinks so highly of you and, and all the things you've done to, to make our place um, very special. So I wanna thank you for taking the time today and, and uh, I really do look forward to, to seeing you back in the Hall of Mirrors when we can get back there in a, in a safe way. And, and uh, that will be a, a very, very enthusiastic day. So I can't wait to, to, uh, to see that. So thanks again for spending some time with us. My, my pleasure. Thank you for doing this. All right. Take care, Doug.